Free dope, free dope, free dope, free dope, free dope, free dope. You're now tapped in to Free Dope, the greatest podcast in the world each week. Bringing you topical conversations that are sometimes intelligent, but absolutely, undeniably hilarious. Yeah, we'll see about that. Podcasting from a city near you, Free Dope starts now. This is going to be a very good one that we have today. What's up? My name is Jerron. I just ask that you keep an open mind, okay? Because like so many of us have already formed opinions about this group, the Westboro Baptist Church. But I'm going to talk to one of its former members and really just dig deep, understanding the motivations behind their actions. And at any point in the conversation, if you want to chime in, just do this right here. Leave a message at 213-935-0606. 213-935-0606 is the number, as always. Please do chime in. Let me know your thoughts as you're listening to this episode, okay? But for many people, you know the Westboro Baptist Church out of Topeka, Kansas. You might even call it a hate group, a cult, a extremist religious organization. But for Zach Phelps Roper, formerly of Westboro Baptist Church, that was his home. He grew up there. Many of his family members are part of the church still. So Zach, thank you for joining me today on Free Dope. Let's talk about it. Hi. Hey, my man. So just take me back real quick. Like, let's start from the beginning. What's your earliest, fondest memory of growing up in Westboro Baptist Church? Well, I have a lot of good memories at Westboro. Um, I would say not my earliest memory, but mm. certainly one thing I really loved was when I was like a teenager, I used to play a lot of uh, video games with my younger brothers, oh, nice. um, particularly Super Smash Brothers Melee for the GameCube. Okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you have that, that family bonding right there. Because I know a lot of you live on the same block, right? Like the church itself is on a, a corner in Topeka, Kansas, right? And everybody lives within that same, essentially same like compound in a way. Well, um, there is there is one block that contains like four or five um, of their houses, mm -hmm. but everybody lives within a block or two cool. of the church now. And of the backyards, like I, I saw that the fences were all taken down. So you have this like giant green space that was connected to the houses and to the church and everybody just got to congregate right there, right? Uh, definitely. They have a swimming pool. They've got multiple uh, trampolines, a basketball court, volleyball court, big toys, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> if, like for the most part, like you said, it was your home. This is what you knew. This is what you grew up in. Most definitely. So then do you know anything about how and when Westboro itself got started well let's see here um I'm trying to think here i think it was i believe it was the 1950s my grandfather basically was um he was asked to come become the pastor of the westboro baptist church it used to be associated with another church in topeka called the east side baptist church um but yeah, within a year or two of him taking over there, he basically cut all ties with Eastside. Mm. And then he basically led the congregation for several decades, even before their picketing started, which I think that started about 1990. I could go into more detail there if you would like me to about what inspired the you know, picketing to begin. Yeah, what inspired the picketing? Yeah, that's, that's what a lot of people know know Westboro for. Like, we'll talk about everything else, but like, that's the number one thing I feel that people know Westboro Baptist Church is is the picketing at the funerals of dead soldiers, even other congregations, sometimes even sporting events. Yeah, definitely. Um, along about 1990, my grandfather was on a bicycle ride in a local park that's just like a half of a mile away from the church building. And he was just on a bike ride with like one of my older siblings. And I guess he was um, like, he got a little bit away. He, like he would bike a little bit further ahead of my sibling and then, you know, bike back and, you know, check on him, make sure he was doing okay. And then he noticed a man trying to try to get my brother to come into the bushes, so to speak. Mm. Um, and he immediately, like, 
he thought that I think that he jumped to a conclusion there. He what what would appear to be like pedophilia behavior he associated with homosexual behavior, which of course is not the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive, but at the same time, I not the same thing are, at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I know <laughs> I've met plenty of homosexuals since leaving Westboro, mm-hmm. and I, w- I got to say, none of them have anything, no interest in, you know, being, you know, having, you know, be having a sexual relationship with a child. Right. But anyways, he went to the Topeka City Council, and he was asking them to do something about the park. He said that there were, like, park benches that were in the middle of the woods, basically, where gay men were having sex on top of them. Like, it was known, Gage Park was known as a cruisy area, mm-hmm. you know, that was known around the country, actually. It was on some kind of circulated pamphlet or something. At least that's what that's what I was taught, anyways, growing up. Um, and so, but basically, the Topeka City Council didn't do anything about it, and he decided to take action and started hitting the streets with picket signs. And saying, you know, his first sign, the first sign said things like, watch your kids, gays in restrooms, you know, things like that. Right. I remember that that particular sign was like, um, it was mounted on a wall inside the church building. Like, as, you know, like one of their, like one of their, like, like an entrance. Yeah. And, um, and it kind of, I mean, when, when, the local churches started coming out against him and saying that, you know, you shouldn't be preaching against homosexuality and stuff. He was like flabbergasted, I guess. He, he as it was described that he, 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 he realized that there was a bigger problem at work. I guess he thought that people were not good Christians anymore and that they needed to be woken up and, you know, that, and that's what kind of drove them to even, to greater picketing and to reaching out and to do another, you know what I mean? Like they yeah. went from just picketing in Topeka to picketing all around the country. And, and that's what, like, I'm glad you said that though, because like to me at its surface, right? Like we can look at Westboro and we can condemn their actions. We can say everything we want to say about them. Right. But when you dig underneath your grandfather, Fred Phelps, yeah. To me, he just struck me as a man who was trying to protect his family the best way he could, although it's very controversial, right? But, like, when you come down to, like, the human nature, the human aspect of things, he seemed like he was just simply trying to protect his family through Scripture and through, like you said, uh, uh, the instance in which um, your uncle was almost lured into the bushes. Exactly. So, um, do you know, like, I guess the basis of your grandfather Fred's teachings? Like, I know it's mostly the book Leviticus, right? Like, do you know, like the scriptures, or? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got quite a bit of biblical education from uh, the Westboro Baptist Church, of course. Um, I we read it almost every, you know, several times a week at least, and every Sunday for sure. But what was like that? What was like that one scripture though, like? that you could point to as like the foundation for all of his teaching. I would probably point to Isaiah 58, one mm. ch- chapter 58, verse one. It says something to the effect of cry aloud, spare not lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions. And of course they connected that with such uh, passages as Leviticus nineteen seventeen and 18, which says something to the effect of, you know, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall in any wise rebuke your your neighbor, your brother, and not suffer his sin upon him. You shall not bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. They believe that their mandate is to preach the word of God because it is what is required of them. Mm-hmm. They have no real desire to apply you know, to like proselytize or convince anybody. It is all about sending the message because once you have the message, once you know what the standard of God is, what what you're supposed to be doing and you're not doing it, then God has every reason to condemn you and to punish you for your sins. And to them, they're doing this out of love, right? Like they're spreading the message out of love. We receive it as hate, but to them, it's, it's their calling. It's them spreading the love of God. Exactly. 
exactly. It doesn't feel like love when my mom calls people simple sluts, for instance. But the idea is, is that they think that they might be able to convince a couple of people to, you know, stop sinning and join them. They don't expect it's going to happen very often, mm -hmm. but they think that they, they, well, they believe that most people are going to go to hell, regardless of whether they hear the word of God or whatever. God, yeah, it's a very, it's a very complicated picture for sure, but, but you're right. It is out of love that they are doing this. And, and then like, I guess, first off, you said that it's their hope that people will join them in the church. What is that process like? Like if somebody comes in off the streets and shows up at one of the services at, at the church, would they be welcome with open arms? Or is, this, or is, this some, is there some type of test they have to go through in order to join the church? It's a very good question. Yeah, there is a process. And I would say that it probably would take at least three to six months for you to become a member from, ver from the beginning of the process to the end of it. And basically what you have to do is convince everybody in the church that you are deserving to become a member of the church. They want to see that you're going to the pickets and preaching the word of God. They want to see you, quote, ministering to the saints, close quote, as they put it, which does, you know, that involves things like, um, you know, babysitting the children or like, helping them remodel their houses because they have a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. um, it, it means that you're going to the church services and basically you're living a moral, upright life. So, But you have to have the entire church agree to for you to become a member because they don't make any major decisions unless it is unanimous. They and, believe that Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And, and what would you say the percentage of the church, like, I guess the makeup of the church, like family versus non-family? Because it's <laughs> like, right? Yeah. Very interesting, that point there. Um, growing up, the thing is, is that they tend to, the distinction between the different families, you know, is kind of disappearing because they intermarry with each other, the right. different clans, basically. There was the Phelps. And then there were the, some of the Davises, there were the Drains, there were the yeah. Hockenbargers. Them, yeah. And, you know, even though I am related by blood or marriage to at least probably 80, 90 percent of the people that are there. Although there are there have been a few families that have or a few people that have joined the church since I left. Um, I believe they're called the Jacques or the Jacques family. And, and there's that one. I forgot his name, but he um, God, he came over from England or London. To join the church. Ah, yes, I know who you're talking about. I think you're talking. He goes by Matthias. His name is uh, uh, Stephen Holroyd. There we go. Yeah, yeah. and he, mm -hmm. I guess, saw the church online and saw the message, and I guess it worked on him, right? Exactly. <laughs> One of few. <laughs> but yes, he he, um, he would say that he was uh, definitely inspired to come to the church, and within about six months, he was a full fledged member. And about six months after that, I think he was married to my cousin, JL. So, there we go, JL. That, yeah. That's, and then, because JL didn't think she was going to get married at one point, right? Because she's a Phelps. So her idea, I guess her image was that she's a Phelps and nobody's good enough to marry her. That's very true. A lot of the people there don't, a lot of the young people don't think that they're ever going to get married because there are so few people in the, um, you know, in the uh, dating pool. <laughs> because that's what strikes me is that of, of the family, there's this, there's this confidence that everybody exudes, like when they're being confronted on the picket lines, for example, right? And somebody's yelling at them or, or throwing things. You see a family member just there smiling back in their face or just reciting some, some scripture, right? And yeah. of your cousin JL, you know, there was this, this image of, of her that she's a Phelps and nobody's good enough to marry her. Like were you guys taught in a way that you're the few chosen ones? Oh, exactly. Yeah. They, they don't believe that there's, that there are very few people outside of their church that are going to go to heaven. There are very few chosen people, so to speak. And what were They're you taught about heaven? Like 
what were you taught about heaven? In hindsight, not enough. <laughs> because, yeah, because that's why I asked. Because to me, the whole teachings that, that you consumed growing up was simply about hell and your relationship to hell and that you would go to hell if you don't go out and pick it or, or, or if you don't go out and, you know, adhere to certain church principles, right? Absolutely. Like, what were some of the things that if you did, you would go to hell like that you were taught? Well, um, if you ever left the church, you definitely were probably were going to go to hell. You know, it was just, of course, I mean, if you deeply question any of their beliefs, you're going to find that there's some inconsistencies there, mm -hmm. you know, um, like what? Very good question. Well, see, like here's, here's something that's interesting. So they will say that, you know, let's say, um, let's, let, I'll use you in, as, as an example, mm -hmm. because they like to say, you know, like, or like Louis Theroux, Louis Theroux, the guy who wrote the, you know, who did the BBC documentaries, He's, they yeah. said he's going. He's in hell, basically. They have a picket sign with his face on it and says, throw in hell. But when you really think about it, they believe that a person can repent in their dying moments. And if that's true, that means that Louis Theroux might not go to hell when he dies. Maybe, maybe he is one of God's elect, right? Yeah. And now, you, you know, when you really think about it, they really shouldn't be holding that sign because they don't know it to be 100 percent true. They and acknowledge it. You know what I mean? Like that's something that they acknowledge. So I don't think that they should be having they don't they shouldn't say signs that say you're going to hell or this person's going to hell because they don't know. They don't know it. And to say that they do. Is intellectually dishonest. It doesn't it's inconsistent with their beliefs. And you know what I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Louis Thoreau and and, uh, and dying because there was an instance in one of the documentaries. I think he was talking to Steve Drain and your mom. I want to say um, Shirley Phelps Roper, um, asking about the passing of your grandfather Fred Phelps and saying, I guess there was a rumor that in his dying days that your grandfather actually took back his teachings, or or said that you know he, he was wrong in hindsight about his teachings. Do you know anything about that? I'm not exactly sure if he, I don't believe that he ever said that he took back anything that he taught, but I will say this about my grandfather's passing, um, at the time and in hindsight, they will tell you that he died a man of God, but that's not what happened behind closed doors. They roundly condemned him as a heretic because he stopped, well, more specifically, it's not what he didn't say, but what he did say, he they said in the meeting where we excommunicated him, and I was part of that meeting because I was a member of the church. See, I'm glad you said that because that's one thing I was trying to get in the documentary. Like, Louis was asking your mom and Steve about if they excommunicated your grandfather from the church, and they have, nobody they have, would say that. We absolutely did. And the reason they said the reason that we did was because it was reported that he stepped out of the front door of the church and he yelled across the street to the equality house which is a you know <laughs> i believe it is a rainbow colored house which right. means it, it 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 is meant to be pro lgbt causes yeah they said that he he yelled to them you are good people now if that's true <laughs> then that means that they yeah. that he thinks that they're good people and that they're yeah. not you know they must that god loves them or you know what i mean that that's yeah. completely inconsistent with his teaching to saying that that god hates homosexuals and the like Right, uh, like it, you know, what I mean, you you can't have both. But maybe so he had like they, a revelation in that moment, you know. And, and like, I'm glad you said that because the Rainbow House is directly across the street from the church. Like, was did that come up in response to the church, or was the church there first? I mean, or was Rainbow House there first? No, the the church was there by several decades. Um, but the um, interesting, the Rainbow House actually helped both of them, both Westboro and, and Planting Peace, the name of the the charity that runs it. Both of them got better, more media coverage because of that. Yeah. <laughs> so Westboro was very happy about that. But yeah. Um, but yeah, do anyways. Think, but, do you think mm -hmm, that could have right. been like a little moment of empathy on your grandfather's part, right? Like, let's say he did walk out in the front door and he yelled, you're good people. Like, what do you think brought that moment on? 
I had a theory about that. I'm not exactly sure if it holds any water at this point because the thing is, is that my grandfather appeared to have like dementia toward okay, the end of yeah. his day. And the thing is, is I, he might have actually done that. And you know, maybe maybe that actually did happen. Maybe he did have a change of heart. I once attributed that to maybe the fact that my grandmother almost passed, you know, way like a few like six or seven months before this happened. See, this happened around August of 2013. My mm -hmm. grandmother was in the, like the ICU. The hospital was not doing well in 20, you know, early 2013. I don't know. I found when I left Westboro that when I was exposed to human compassion my heart opened up for other people yeah. and I started to want, you know, I wanted to practice unconditional love for other people. And I wanted to, I, I don't know. I, I definitely have gone through some changes since I left the church, but I wasn't sure if maybe my grandfather had a similar experience. Unless, yeah. I mean, it could be the thing where he's, he was on this path of maybe he got too far down one path. Right. And, love the power and control that came with his teachings but deep down he knew there was something more something different right like he he grew this monster and he could no longer control it could very well be it's hard to say unfortunately he's not with us anymore yeah mm -hmm. who's running the church now then oh yeah uh good question so when my grandfather was in trouble basically with the church and was uh -huh. no longer preaching um, there were eight pastors that basically sprung up from the ranks. All of these were married men in their thir you know, at least 35 years of age or older, including my brother, Sam. And they all, um, these eight men asked to become pastors and they had evidence in the Bible that said, you know, maybe that doesn't need to be just one pastor. Maybe we can have more than one. And so these men, um, of course had a lot of influence because they're men mm -hmm. and the Bible's, you know, it's there are definitely some gender stereotypes there's you know there's issues like that at westboro they definitely don't think women have as much power or clout as men they're not but, allowed to preach and stuff like that but, but when you see correct. westboro though sorry to cut you off because let's, no I, because when you, you said that you know there is that gender dynamic at play within the church mm -hmm. but whenever i see westboro like being interviewed like on the picket lines right it's the women speaking typically it's your mom or, or like other females or the, or, or the vocal ones when it comes to the picket lines and stuff. Like, why is that then? Like, if the women don't have that much power within the church, why are they essentially the ones on the picket lines in the forefront? <laughs> My mom has a way of attracting attention for one. <laughs> but it, it's a different story in the actual church building during church services. Got they it. don't believe that women are... They believe that women are supposed to be silent mm -hmm. and that they wear the... Um, you know, the Headless. scarf or the bonnet yeah. or whatever, cover their heads during the church services, and only men are allowed to preach from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. However, there is evidence in the Bible that there were female prophetesses, you know, and they were able to speak for God in public, basically. Mm -hmm. Not like in the church services, but like out on the streets, so to speak. Um, like there was Deborah the prophetess in the book of Judges. Isaiah, I believe, had a, the prophet Isaiah also had a wife who was a prophetess. Prophet, prophetess as well. <laughs> Anyways, um, but yeah, that's um, I, my mom just has a way of attracting a lot of attention. She's very vocal. She, of mm -hmm. course, sings and stuff. She has. <laughs> Your mom has a great voice. I'm not gonna lie. Your mom yeah. has a hell of a voice. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> that's the one thing. But on the subject of your mom, though, like when I when I talked to her back in 2006, like when I was working on the Adam Carolla show, it was my job to. At first, I found her as a guest, and then it was my job to pre-screen her. So every single time we booked her on the show, I would be the one calling the church phone number, talking to her on the phone. And she was the sweetest person to me on the phone. And to see, to know, you know, she's the same person out there with those signs and being as vocal as she, as she was, that was just something hard to square up. Like, is there, I guess, is there two sides to your mom? Like, within the church, is... It like a loving, warm, compassionate place for those who are part of the church. Meanwhile, we have this other image we get from them on the outside. My mom definitely has a couple different sides to her. Hmm. When I think about my mom, when I see when I was in a, when I was in school taking an anatomy class, they talked about these different layers of the brain. They called it the pia mater and the dura mater, which means the soft mother and the hard mother. Hmm. <laughs> 
Um, my mom definitely has a hard side to her that you usually see on the picket line. And you also see it when she is disciplining her children for mm-hmm. sure. Um, like how, how bad was the discipline? Like, was it like read it like in biblical discipline, I would say. Well, I think that my parents took it a bit to an extreme mm. sometimes. Uh, they probably, they would tell you that corporal punishment like spanking is perfectly fine, that the Bible says that that's all good, but it's not something that I think is a great thing. And uh, I can highlight one story yeah. that I think would probably, not to drag my mom's name through the mud. Not, not at all. No, because... Perfect, None of us are perfect people. We Nobody all make is. mistakes and right. stuff. But I don't think that she ever apologized for this particular mistake. Hmm. But when I was in my college days, long about the end of two, the 2000s, one of my cousins got in some trouble with my mom because my mom was upset about the way that this cousin was running around the track. My mom, for some reason, has a problem with the way people posture sometimes. Mm. Like, I got in trouble because I was bending down to load a dishwasher a certain way that was better in line with, you know, like, using my knees, so to speak, rather than arching my back. And I got in trouble. You were injured at that time, though, right? Like, when that happened? Yeah, yeah. That was toward the end of my time at Westboro. Um, But basically... My mom was very upset about this particular cousin, and I don't know why, because they were supposed to run a mile or two, and they were running just fine. But she was upset about, I guess she thought that maybe the cousin was dragging their heels or something. But what happened was, in front of many of the young people, because we were about to do like, like a Sunday school kind of thing, but it was like during the summertime, right? We had plenty of time to like, read the Bible and stuff in front of all these people. She took a paddle and chased this cousin of mine for about a mile and was smacking her, spanking her about every 10 or 12 steps. Wow. And I, and I'm not kidding. It was about probably 80 or a hundred swats. Wow. On her butt as she was running around the track. So I'm just saying, That that's an extreme example. Yeah, yeah. But I definitely think that they take corporal punishment to an extreme, and I really hope that someday my mom would apologize to this cousin of ours. And, I'm not gonna. I can't give any more details yeah, about no. this cousin for their. And, and I thank you for sharing that story them. because it just seems like there's this whole dynamic in which, you know, you the elders are not to be questioned, right? Like. You're not you're not allowed to have an opinion, even though you're a, a, a functioning human being of your own with a brain of your own. You can't ask any sort of questions whatsoever. Like, is that your experience? I agree with you, and that you know they there's a double standard there. They say that you know every member of the church is equal, that everyone has a voice, and everyone should be heard. However, if you are older than the person that you're having a discussion or a, a disagreement with. The older person is always in the right. The younger person is always in the wrong, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And so if an older person tells you to shut the hell up, it's your job to shut up. So when it came time to uh, picking the signs for for, for the protests, um, did any younger people get a say in which sign they wanted to choose, or was it all assigned to them? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sure, particularly, um, yeah, definitely. Definitely, especially on the out-of-town pickets where we, we got to pick whatever signs we wanted to hold. My mom really liked the America's Doom sign for whatever reason. How many signs are there, by the way? Like thousands? Well, I can tell you this much. I, I personally had a hand in creating hundreds of them. So it's like There's a sign for every occasion. Yeah. <laughs> like, They've got some guys... really old ones, too. Really old ones, you said? <laughs> yes, yeah, very old ones, but... They do. They the signs that get a lot of heavy usage, they get replaced. Mm. And do you mind talking about like the signs you created? Um, certainly. I mean, um, most of the picket signs that I made were just the out of town ones. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, basically they have um, in the days when Steve Drain, <laughs> when he came, he kind of revolutionized the uh, sign making process. He made it all computerized, so they had like print like these massive, like I don't know, it's like six foot by eight foot, you know, papers, and it's like, yeah. yeah my grandfather used to cut out the letters like <laughs> one at a time. Hodgepodge, kind of, kind of decoupage a little bit, right? Yeah, like. Uh like my grandfather could take a whole day making a single sign. Steve Drain could make like six or eight in a day. <laughs> but, but like you said, you just you would go to out of town pick. It's like what's like the furthest place, you know, you, you would go you would travel to because I know you guys took Southwest multiple times, right? Like you would spend <laughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars on air travel, right? Most definitely. My mom used to say they spend about a quarter million dollars on travel for pickets every year, and all to spread. God's message of love. Exactly. <laughs> now you're getting it. <laughs> it, it but if, where do they get the money from? That's what I want to know. Like, where does it, where do they get the money from? Um, I know a lot of the church members are very successful, like lawyers and doctors are talking about majority lawyers though, but it's a very small congregation. How do they come up with a quarter of a mil to spend on travel? Well, some of them make more than six figures. Like my oh, dad, wow. Um, oh, wow. like he, he, he has like, in addition to his nine to five job, mm. he also has like, like rental properties and mm. he's got like, he, he created a book called using computers in the law office, which he has updated multiple times, which is like a, a book that people use for, com, you know, for law school, right? probably at Washburn university, you know, or the, his alma mater, but, um, but yeah, they, they, they have money and they, you know, they, you know, they save money for their picket trips and stuff. Yeah, they, because I think when people look at, you know, the church on the picket lines, they just think they're just a bunch of whack jobs who live in like in a bunch of double wides, right? But no, they're, they're very intelligent, highly successful people, which is like, you know, another layer to this whole puzzle that we're dealing with. But when we go back to the, the signs real quick, though, what's up with the message God hates fags? That's the most popular one. Yeah, it's the name of their website too, and I, I apologize. Uh, yeah. You know, growing up, I didn't realize that that was a that using the fag as a slur. It's mm -hmm. it's a very offensive term. It's meant to demean people, and I don't use it anymore. Right. And <laughs> we're just using it in anyways. context of the conversation. <laughs> but anyways, um, but yeah, uh, my grandfather. That was. Definitely the most popular message, the most right. when it got the most attention because, of course, it God hates, you know. Of course, they have a lot of signs that say God hates Jews or God hates Catholicism. Or and they're also Catholic. cheering, like, women who have breast cancer, right? That's like... Uh, Thank God, God for cancer. Stuff right, like, exactly, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. they um very, uh, very um bombastic, I would say. Because... In my, I guess, partial understanding of this whole, of, of everything with the signs is first they meant the word facts to mean everybody, not just, you know, those who engage in, you know, homosexual activity, but anybody who might have had sex outside of wedlock, right? Um, and anybody who supports gay marriage. And it was their way of getting everybody to repent because in the Bible, like a lot of laws we have in place or a lot of, a lot of sin in the Bible are laws that we have in place, right? But there's no condemnation, no laws against being gay on the books. Well, they would probably turn to Leviticus eighteen twenty two, which is what they it says, Thou shalt not not thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It mm -hmm. is abomination and it it's in the same part of the Bible that talks about bestiality being a sin and other stuff, incest all that kind of stuff. But basically, um, but yeah, I mean, they say they believe that they know who God is, that the Bible is the word of God and that God hates most of his creation. Hmm. And of course they refer to, they say fags. Of course, they will also say that God hates fags and fag enablers. So not, mm -hmm. so that's, that's how they wrap up to basically include Everybody outside of Westboro, because either you are a homosexual or you are an enabler of the homosexual lifestyle, right. both of which are condemned by Westboro in the Bible, as they put it. And yeah, and it's like, it's like everything. <laughs> it's such a 
very narrow teaching of the Bible. Like, was there any ever any venturing into the New Testament? Because everything I, I, I hear, I guess, it's like very Old Testament, Testament vengeful, vengeful, wrathful God. You know? Yeah, my my dad says his favorite book of the Bible is the Book of Revelation because it's payback time, oh. as he calls it. But they, but yeah, um, now they 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 do believe in the whole Bible. Mm. Um, it's interesting because. My grandfather never really said why he why he preferred the King James version. It's just it's just it's just it's just a preference. Mm. But um, you know, they just I don't know. They're very I don't know. They're very closed minded folk, unfortunately. But they, it's it's like you know, it's their way, right? Not their way in a way, but like they they're saying we know the right way, we know how to get to heaven, this is the way you do it. It's your job to follow us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have an absolute truth, and they cling to it <laughs> like a oh god, yeah. And I just want to back up to the 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 pickets real quick. Like, what was it about the funerals of you know soldiers who who died in you know the line of action, right? Like, why choose those funerals specifically to protest? Well. I would say it definitely got them a lot of attention, yeah. but they would, they often say that it's because if you are fighting for a nation that has made God their enemy, then you are putting yourself in the line of getting, you know, some vengeance from, you know, God's vengeance, basically. If you were a good American or whatever, you wouldn't be sending your sons to fight for a nation that, you know, values homosexuality, basically. That's about all there is to it. They you know, And what was it like, I guess, for you, like participating in, in those protests, like being there, holding up signs and getting things thrown at you, yelled at, spat at, like was it ever demoralizing? Oh yeah. I was actually quite frightened most of the time. I developed really? a lot of social anxiety because of the picketing and stuff. It was it didn't whenever hit you me as see much... them sorry, when whenever you oh. see members uh, of the church, you know, picketing like they're fighting back, not like, you know, physically, but verbally. They're, they're oh, yeah. there with the words. They're ready to go. They, they, they know why they're there. And they, have their whole, their, they, hold, they hold their ground. Yeah. I think my mom might be a little bit crazy. <laughs> but, oh, but, but she had to build yeah, up such like... a thick skin, though, right? Like, had to build up all this, you know, put up this wall <laughs> yourself to, you, you know, be the one that is quote unquote the the, the truth dweller or, or, or the truth giver and everybody else are the outsiders. Yeah. The thing is, is that, you know, even when I was at Westboro, like going through high school, I started to develop an appreciation for like science mm -hmm. and started to kind of go beyond some of their paradigm, I think. And, you know, I just, I don't know. I just, I was exposed to a lot of violence on the picket line right. and I didn't like it. I really didn't like it. I didn't want to be around people that, you know, were going to try to punch me in the face or whatever. I was exposed to a little bit of violence, not a lot, fortunately, right. but a little bit. And it just, it, it was nerve wracking. I never wanted to go out to picket. Especially and what was it like as I got older and, you know, realized that this was like not something I, I don't know. I just, <sighs> mm. Yeah, and what was it like going to public school, you know, because that's one thing I find very, very fascinating is it wasn't the situation in which, you know, you were locked in to the property of Westboro. You were able to go to public school, right? Um, being known as, you know, the family from the Westboro Baptist Church, like what was that like? And why were you allowed to go to public school in the first place? Well, to answer the second question there first, um, my mom said that it was something something akin to that we were walking picket signs, and it was just another way for them to be able to get their message out, I guess, because people knew who we were, they thought about us, they thought about the picket signs, and, you know, for, I mean, I, I kind of enjoyed it. I was nice meeting, I mean, I, I wasn't really close friends with most of the people I was mm -hmm. in school with, but you know, it was, 
was, it was a pretty, pretty pleasant experience for the most part. There were some times when I got bullied or, you know, got into like arguments with people. And I don't know, like by the time I was 17 or 18, I was just starting to, I guess, doubt whether I, you know, like I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself, I guess, as a person that I, you know, I, I didn't feel like I belonged at Westboro for whatever reason. It just was like a very deep seated fear, I guess. And it, I don't know. I like, as I, you know, I started to have more problems with my parents, you know, as I was in my college years, I left when I was 23. Right. Um, but basically I packed my bags and left and then returned about three or four times. Wait, you left? Oh yeah. Yeah. Wait, I'm, how I did left. that work then? How, how did you leave? Cause I, I thought like once you left, you can never come back. Well, if you say that you're repentant and that you, you know, like my parents thought that I was just rebelling against them, not necessarily the religion. Got it. And so I think that that's, but I, I genuinely felt penitent and like, I, you know, like, cause I, I love my family, right? Yeah. I didn't want to lose them. And that's what drove me to keep coming back, even though I felt really miserable there sometimes. And like, what's, what, what toll did it take on your, on your mental health at that point? I was pretty much anxious and depressed constantly. Mm. It wasn't very pleasant by the time I was, you know, by the time I left. Um, and what was that one moment that you went through that you said, okay, this is enough. Like I've, I've had it. I'm done. I'm, I'm gone. For, I'm leaving for good. What was that one moment? Yeah. So to kind of give a little context here, I got injured my very first day working as a registered nurse mm. at my very first job as a nurse. So that was about six weeks or so before I left. And the, th the reason I say this is because I developed some trigger points in my, my shoulders. Mm. Basically it just felt like a lot of pain burning and I didn't know what was going on with it. And just like, I stopped, Wanting, I, I was telling my parents, you know, I can't go and, you know, remodel such, such and so, you know, such and someone's house or whatever. I need some time to rest and, you know, try to figure out what's going on here. And, you know, my dad was taking me physical therapy, stuff like that. He was trying to help, but he was also saying that he thought that I wasn't praying enough. Mm. And basically, I got to the point where I was in so much pain. I said, you know, I, I think I need to go to the emergency room. This was about 1030 at night on uh, February 20th of 2014. And my dad just let me have it. He, he thought that I was just bullshitting them, that I was mm. just making up. I was just exaggerating all this pain I was having or that I wasn't having any at all. I was just trying to get out of doing, you know, volunteer work for the church, which I was always zealous and so happy to do. Like, it was completely out of character for me. Like, it was such bullshit in hindsight, but my dad just, you know, he, he thought that I was just fucking around with him. And, you know, he, you know, I, I said, you know, do you believe me? He said, no, I don't believe you go back to bed. And I said, I think I need to go to the ER though. Yeah. Can you help me out here? And he got right up in my face and shouted at me, basically go to bed. And it was, I guess, at that point when I realized that I was living in fear of my own parents. And I was just like, I can't live like this. Mm. And I said, okay, I, I, I'm leaving. And you about told him right there that you were leaving. Yeah. About five minutes later, as he started, my dad started to cool down. He approached me again, this time in my room yeah. and said, you know, are, are you actually going to leave or are you just upset? And I, I said, you know, I, I don't love this religion anymore. And hmm. it was, you know, I thought that I was being punished for being an obedient servant of God. Yeah. I thought that at that point in time when I was still, you know, a deist, so to speak, I did believe in God when I was at Westboro. But I thought I was being punished despite trying my best to, to, to be a good son, to be a good member of the church. But that's what you're taught, though. You're taught that God would inflict punishment on those who aren't worthy of his love. Exactly. And I guess, I guess at that point, I didn't feel like I was feeling the love anymore. It's very easy for them to, you know, to be, to think, you know, 
it's okay for mm-hmm. God to, you know, just be merciless and cruel toward 99.9% of humanity. You know, he, pre- he predestinates them to commit sin and then he punishes them for doing it. So mm-hmm. he is the cause of, he is the author of sin and yet doesn't take responsibility for it and punishes people. It's easy for the people of Westboro to say that that's perfectly fine because God is the one in charge. He can do whatever he wants with his creation. But if you're one of the outsiders, fuck that. Yeah. That's an unfair that's unfair. By any any human measure of justice, that's completely unfair. And you know what? I started to feel like an outsider and I said, "You know what? This is bullshit." <laughs> it like it is it is hit you in that moment right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I was just like, you know what? I I don't want any part of this. This is bullshit. Yeah. You so know? like, so when when he realized it was bullshit, okay, you're like, all right, I'm done. I'm out. Peace, mom. Peace, dad. I'm gone. Was there any sort of like family meeting they have? It's like one last time to say, hey, hey, Zach. You know, we, we know things might not be going well for you right now, but we're here for you. We we can get you the help you need. We can get you, you know, any medical treatment that you might want, just as long as you stay here. Like, was there any effort? to get you to stay one thing what you see this like i said this was about 10 30 at night Mm. and after this happened i broke down in tears and could not be consoled by my parents no matter how much they tried to offer a hug or something i wouldn't accept it because i was just like this is bullshit i literally ran about a mile away and went to one of my cousin's houses that had left the church already yes okay and I stayed with them until about six o'clock in the morning. And then my dad sent me a text message and he asked me if they wanted me to take me to the ER. Mm. And he did come over and we almost went to the ER. And then my sister-in-law, who is a nurse as well, said, you know what? This is probably a work comp issue. So it's not a good idea to take him to the ER directly. He needs to go through you know, the employer because we both worked at the same hospital. Okay. And she was one of my coworkers. She helped me get the job. Anyways, but after that, my dad brought me back to my cousin's house. A few hours later, they had all of my stuff from my bedroom packed and set out on the front porch. Wait, they took all your stuff out of your room and put it on the front porch, and that was it? That was it. And they asked me to come get my stuff. That was the very next morning. And And have you talked to them since? A handful of times. Okay, so, so you are in communication with them, even though you left the church. Not really. Not really. Because, because I know, yeah, like once you, once you're out of the church, you're forgotten about. Like you're erased. My dad takes down the photos of people that leave the church. So yeah, they have no desire to remember remember me. Anything they don't care about anything I have to say because like, I left the church. What do they think of you now? Like, do they see you as, as this heathen, this sinner, you know, that that's yep. going to hell? That's exactly how they would put it. I'm just a heretic to them. I'm just another You're person. of the world. Mm-hmm. Damn. So, like, like, you know, it's just real life consequences in a way, you know what I mean? Like, talking about the breaking up of families. In, in it's, a right yeah. it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. I really wish that they weren't like that, but sometimes things like religion, there are other things that break up families too, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Not to give religion a bad rap. I right. know a lot of great Christians, a lot of kind people right. that are religious. But this is your personal experience with it. Like, So what was that like, those first moments like, right? The first days after you, ha- you, have, you left the church, you have your stuff, right? What were you staying at, at a friend's or a cousin's house? Yeah, I moved in with another cousin, Mm -hmm. (laughs) a different cousin uh, that next morning. Um, And what were those first days like? Did you think you were all alone in the world? Like, you have like, like, you know, this this place that you were taught to condemn and be afraid of and these people that weren't worthy of God's love. Like, did you think at that point that, you know, you're going to be all alone? You know, for a few, few weeks there, a few months there, yeah. I was, and it wasn't until I discovered Facebook and mm. discovered, you know, when I started doing a few interviews. Wait, how, what, what year did you discover Facebook, by the way? Because it came out, like, I think, like, 2014. 
Uh, so like it's it's been it, yeah. <laughs> well, that seems yeah, to be a theme um... though. With sorry, to catch you up, but it seems to be a theme though. Like within the church and like you know the younger generation is the fact that when they come across social media, they start opening up to this whole different world in a way, right? Like absolutely the real world. Yeah, <laughs> but, but not the world that we not the world that we were taught exists, yeah. but the actual world, the compassionate. The, the very genuine world. Yeah, there's so a lot of genuinely compassionate people out there. Westboro is wrong to say that there's nobody that's compassionate or that, that gives a shit about you. There's a lot yeah. of people in this world that care about. And, care about and like, I guess what what do you think the what did you think the perceptions of people would be knowing? your history right knowing who you are and the family that you're part of and the church that you you know attended right like what did you think their perceptions of you would be once you've told them who you are and when you met them out like in college or like out you know in the world itself yeah as i kind of alluded to earlier i had a lot of social anxiety when i first left westboro because Mm -hmm. i didn't think most people would accept me Mm -hmm. If knowing that, I, I mean, shortly after I left Westboro, I realized, you know, we hurt a lot of people's feelings. We, you know, just, you know, destroyed people's holy, you know, like to, to fuck with someone's funeral right. of their fallen children. Yeah. That's a horrible thing, man. That That's really painful yeah. to, you know, like, and I wanted to do something about that. I wanted to, you know, ever since leaving Westboro, I've wanted to kind of blaze a, a more compassionate path, a more peaceful, a more loving path. And I definitely have made strides in that direction, I think. You, did, you definitely found, have. Yeah. I found that people were very compassionate. A lot of people that I used to work with in Topeka, you know, after I left or whatever, I told them about what happened with me when I left and they were very understanding and they just were like, you were just trying to be a good person. You know, it's, Mm -hmm. I mean, everything that Westboro does, of course, is out of love. Right. Although it doesn't feel like it, of course. And I don't really think that that's the, you know. And also about you, like you didn't choose to join the church, right? This is the hand you were dealt. This is what you were born into, right? So you knew no better. You know, so you grew up in it and you honestly thought that you were working in the best entrance, the best interest of God and saving humanity and spreading the good word, spreading the gospel to people and, and getting them to repent so they could enjoy the kingdom of heaven. Exactly. And I found that a lot of people were very willing to forgive me for my mistakes. So like what was like the, I guess, the hardest teaching for you to shake? Or what has been the, what has been the hardest teaching for you to shake? Well, fortunately, I did shake this one off, Mm -hmm. but for a while there, you know, I did two things. First of all, I thought that I was just a sinner and that I was Mm -hmm. one of the wick. I I thought that God hated me, basically. And when I realized that, you know, Westboro wasn't exactly right about some of their predictions, like, say, Obama being the Antichrist and taking over the world and destroying humanity and, you know, all this stuff like that didn't happen. That didn't come to pass. That was, and the Bible says that if, if a prophet <laughs> makes a prediction and they're wrong about it, you can consider them a false prophet and mm. you don't have to, you don't, you know, like, of course, they would say something to the effect of go, you know, you can go stone that person with stones, you know, because they're a false prophet, but not, not advocating that here. But basically, right. Westboro doesn't always get everything right. right. And you know what? It says, You know, there is no peace, saith my God, unto the wicked. But why was I feeling more at peace and less anxious and a little bit lighthearted, more lighthearted when I left Westboro? Mm -hmm. Because you you don't have that that burden of hell hanging over you. Like every single thing you you did, you were going to go to hell for. Absolutely. Uh, Do you think that was like, I guess, a control mechanism in a way? Like to get you to adhere to what they wanted you to do, like, like the power they could exhibit over you was the use of hell. I don't know if they have, if they actually truly play power games at Westboro like that. Mm -hmm. I know some people do Mm -hmm. are very manipulative like that. 
Like I Steve Jones? I do, well, I'm not sure about him, but, but anyways, um, but I don't think that they genuinely wanted to hurt people by mm -hmm. telling them to be afraid of hell. But to answer your other question, though, I was afraid of like the book of Revelation coming to pass. Mm -hmm. And so like when there was a red moon at one point, like back in 2016 or something, I was afraid the book of Revelation was going to come to pass. And then nothing happened the next day. <laughs> and I was just like, is every like... <sighs> Well, one thing I find interesting too yeah. is that, like, you know, <laughs> not many people have read the book of Revelations. Like, the one thing about Westboro is that you guys know your scripture, you know the Bible through and through, like from front to back. Like, how how often did you have to go to Bible study, or like, or like, how long were you spending, you know, in the Bible itself? I would say we studied the Bible at least several hours every week. Most and, of that probably in the church services, but you know. Two or three yeah. times a week, my dad would try to get us as a family to, you know, read the Bible. And again, it was just him keeping a close family unit and protecting his family from the fear of the outside world, right? The fear of the unknown, like or like not even the fear of the unknown, because they know what's on the outside world, and they don't want that path for you. They don't want your soul to be condemned to hell for eternity. So everything they were doing was out of love. Right. And so, like, now that you've, I guess, have left the church and you're all about love, empathy, grace, and working on a new book as well, mm -hmm. um, tell me about that, that book a little bit real quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, um, shortly after I left Westboro, I discovered some spiritual teachers. They run a website called LonerWolf.com. They wrote an article called The Seven Paths of Involution. Basically, it's about how to become a more loving person, how to develop mental techniques towards self-mastery. Mm. And so in this article, they talked about there were these different spiritual teachers that they said were considered self-masters or, or masters for short, basically. These are people that are very wise, that have come into humanity and blazed a path of love and understanding and peace and harmony and unity and like millions and billions of people follow their teachings around the world. I'm talking like people like Jesus, of course, mm -hmm. but also like the Buddha, Socrates, Lao Tzu, Confucius, and many other spiritual teachers. Um, most of them are men, of course, because women didn't have much of a voice until the last couple of centuries. But I decided to study these teachers that this article talked about because I was like, I want to understand what is self mastery because it it meant something to me. Like, why do I feel like I'm a slave to my emotions? Why do mm -hmm. I feel so much misery? Is there a solution for that? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, in researching all of these different teachers, I dis I discovered you know this is something that I think everyone could benefit from. And so I decided to put you know I decided to write a book about these different teachers. It's called the Masters. How to achieve self mastery and spiritual enlightenment. And some of the questions you ask, like to start, like, you know, do you feel happy? Do you feel at peace? Do you love yourself unconditionally? Can you access your inner wisdom? Like, I guess, how is how are you now taking what you went through with Westboro, right? And, and finding some good in that to apply to, to, to life right now and, and, and to help people who might be going through, you know, tough situations who need a little bit of love and empathy. I definitely think that the teachings of these these uh, masters can benefit everyone from every walk of life. They have so much wisdom, and you know, in in this book that I wrote, I I have a brief biography about a page or two for each person, mm -hmm. and then I have a selection of their teachings, just a couple of pages, and then just some quotes attributed to each of these teachers. Yeah. And so, you know, I wrote about twenty four different teachers and I just um I was so it was so inspiring to hear their word you know like it, tell me what you think of this quote okay, let's go <laughs> it's um I believe it is a quote by Lao Tzu he's the guy that wrote the Tao Te Ching which is like the book of Taoism or Taoism like you yeah. know the yin yang you know with the white and black circle and stuff I read like the first page of that book <laughs> yeah it's it's a great book Tao and Ching, yeah. um 
he said, I'm trying to remember it because I want to quote it perfectly. <laughs> but he said something to the effect of, he who values the world as much as he values himself can be entrusted with the ruling of the world. He who loves the world as much as he loves himself can be entrusted with the guidance of the world. Mm. In other words, what he's saying is, if you want to be in a position of leadership, like say in the government, for instance, which is actually an aspiration of mine, I want to run for public office. Yeah. You know, in order to do that effectively, you need to love other people and value their needs as much as you love yourself, which is the same thing as like what Jesus said. He said, you know, he said, you know, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. On these two laws hang all, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And, and they all come down to empathy, right? Like just having empathy, compassion for your neighbor. Like it's just the whole world can change just by exhibiting empathy. Like you received it on your end, right? Like, you know, when you left the church, you weren't, you weren't, I mean, you might've been faced with some people who were, you know, trying to run away from you. But for the most part, you were (laughs) receiving empathy and compassion from people and it changed your whole world. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I just love that. And maybe, maybe Westboro can adopt a message of compassion and empathy to kind of get their message. You know, when my, (laughs) when my grandfather passed, there was someone, a couple of people, they held up a banner that said, we're sorry for your loss. Mm. And I was so, if that's not loving your enemy, I don't know what is. Yeah. That was something that was very important to people like Jesus. And you know, one of my other favorite spiritual teachers was Martin Luther King Jr. And he, he said, Mm. he he talked about the same stuff as Jesus did. Yeah. It was a modern day master, and it was it. It's just so amazing that we have access to people like him, and other spiritual teachers that have come and gone throughout human history. That just, it, they're just deeply inspiring people. And I really wish that Westboro would try to open up their eyes a little bit mm-hmm. to seeing the way that they saw the world. When you, I want to back up for a second to your book because you know you started, you mentioned other teachings, religions, right? Studying other religion, religions and teachings, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. you know, for for your for your book. Because you are doing that, right? Like, would you know the former church Westboro say that you're some type of devil worshiper because you are discovering other teachings outside of Christianity? Yeah, they would definitely think that I'm some kind of uh, spawn of Satan or whatever. I mean, it, you know, it's interesting. They, um, I've often thought about the uh, the Beast of Revelation, mm-hmm. and for whatever reason, I thought it was kind of interesting because, like, this beast he he basically comes and he he kind of unites the world, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. So he has kind of a bad rap in the Bible, but. You know, we could definitely use a lot more union in our world. We could use a lot more compassion and empathy and understanding. And, you know, all of these different spiritual teachers, like, like like I said, from Buddhism to Christianity, you know, Islam, et cetera, Hinduism, they all talk about these spiritual teachers all talked about the same values. Love was one of their most important teachings that they all talk about all of these masters because you can't be a master of your own emotions if you are a slave to anger and hatred and mm-hmm. jealousy and you know all this other toxic shit right that we that you know sometimes we get we get lost in those head spaces and you know do, do you have the uh stuff, right right do you do you have your your, your 10 gap your 10 guidelines of masters handy. Yeah, I do actually. Mm -hmm. Just just run through them real quick for me. I know, I know people want to hear them for sure. Most definitely. You want me to just give you the short version? (laughs) Uh, whatever's clever for you. I know you got to go like in 12 minutes. I'm going to 
try to wrap it up for you. Sure. Okay. I'll keep it very short. I'll just do the short version. So, So the 10 guidelines of the masters and I didn't, I originally thought to call this commandments, but Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not about trying to tell people what to do anymore. Not trying to be blasphemous. (laughs) Yeah, that would be blasphemous to the masters. You know, these kind of people just want to help other people. You know, I just want to help other people. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. I can try to point you in a direction of wisdom that, you know, supports everybody's needs, but Anyways, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, though, real quick, that, that's what religion is to me, right? It's like you have a bunch of different religions, and at the end of the day, it's just paths to help you become the best version of you you can possibly be. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah, that that's, that's, all, that's all it is. It's like it's not, for, it's not your job to you know, put your religious beliefs on, on somebody else, right? It's for them to find their path, their way. You can exhibit, you can, you can give them compassion and empathy to help them. But it's not your job to condemn them. Uh, so that's my little, my little soapbox moment real quick. I'll, I'll let you get back to your, your 10 guidelines of masters. As I was kind of mentioning earlier, um, there are many paths to the, mount, to the summit of Mount Fuji. Mm-hmm. But the summit is the same, love. Mm-hmm. So without further ado, the 10 guidelines of the masters learn continuously Grow inwardly, be humble, be grateful. Beware the egoic traps like greed, power, jealousy, revenge, arrogance, materialism, stuff like that. Avoid the common traps, basically. And then love everyone, help others, do no harm as best as you can anyways. Abhor war and lead by example. That's all. I love it, man. I love I love it <laughs> like how, you know, you've come so far. Right? To like being born like into, you know, having like essentially being dealt this hand that you had no choice but to navigate through to finding, you know, your passion, your calling, right? So I'm I'm just I'm just happy for you, man. And it's been so so awesome to talk to you. Um, before we go, do you have a a minute or two to answer a couple of voicemails? I put the number out. Um, said that I was going to have a member of the Westboro Baptist Church, a former member of the Westboro Baptist Church, on the show. I didn't say who it was, um, but I have some voicemails uh, to get through real quick. You can sure. chime in at any point in the conversation. Leave a message at 213-935-0606. 213-935-0606 is the number as always. Okay, here's the first message that we have for you, Zach. Listen, I have a question for the Baptist Church. Uh, what is something that you believed before that now you know was completely false and really changed your perspective? Thanks. Something that you uh, you were taught that you know now in hindsight is not true whatsoever. Well, they basically told me that every homosexual was a beast and were violent prone and were just going to wreck your life if you had anything to do with them. Mm. That's absolute bullshit. (laughs) So so what's what's your relationship with the LGBTQ (laughs) plus community now? Well, I have quite a few friends who are gay or... I have a few friends who are lesbian too, from Topeka even, that I met in person that are very good people to me. And I also have quite a few transgender friends as well. I I don't look at them any different than my other friends. I mean, love is love, compassion is compassion. Were there any members of the church who might secretly be gay? And the reason, particularly outsiders, right? And the reason they were drawn to the church was to kind of hate that part of themselves. Well, I can tell you, and I won't, I can't give any specifics, but I can definitely tell you that there are some people who left the church that are of the LGBT persuasion, and I love them so much. Yeah, I love that. (laughs) And and are there any, um, I guess, truths that you learned in Westboro that still ring true today? We we heard about the negative, but like, what's something good, right? That you were taught in the church that you look back and said, actually, that's that's right. That that, that is the way you live life. 
Well, this isn't really religious related, but in a way, my dad was, he had a, you know, well, they believe in exercise, obviously. They believe in getting an education. These are all things that I support as well. They believe yeah. in being law-abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. They believe in service to others. Obviously, I mean, <laughs> I... <laughs> you got to find service for yourself. Well, I mean, I, I remodeled houses, yeah. you know, as part of my service to the church for at least 10 or 12 years right. from the time I was about 10 years old. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of good things that they have to teach us, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, and there's nothing wrong with that. And if yeah. that's all that they taught me, you know, I'm still happy that they, they taught me to be customer service minded. They taught mm -hmm. me that I should be, that I should do my best when I work to mm -hmm. put forth my best effort. You know, yeah. like when I ran cross country in high school, I tried to do, I, I was the fastest runner for at least a couple months there. Yeah. And you know, my, you know, my dad encouraged me to do that. He said, do the work, no excuses, you know, yeah. like, so. <sighs> yeah. So you, you learn. Yeah. So, you know, it's not all, I mean, there, there is some good, right. With a lot of bad. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't really have too many like deep philosophical. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but... you learn you learn some things, right? You, you you had some life experiences, and this is the path that was predestined for you in a way, you know. And you're making Absolutely. the best of it. Next message. Hi, yes, my name is Shannon, and I'm wondering now that you're no longer a member of Westboro, I'm curious to know what is your relationship to religion, and uh, do you have a practice? Thank you. I would say that. I'm more spiritual than religious, although mm -hmm. I do subscribe to, like I said, I, I have learned about many different spiritual teachers from many different religious paths. Yeah. And, you know, I, I am more a follower of the teacher than I am of the religion because the yes. religions have gone through a lot of different machination, you know, mental machination. Religion is man-made, so religion can be changed to whatever, you know, people yeah. want to uh, uh, perceive it as, right? But no, you follow the teacher, the teachings. Yeah, but there is a lot in the Bible that I I love the book of Proverbs, the book of mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes. You know, there are there's a lot of really good advice in there. Yeah, and you know, like I don't know, some some of the stories of the Bible were just, you know, a lot of people at Westboro really like the book of Esther or the book of Ruth. It's a romance. Yeah, you know, there, you know, there, there's there's some cool, there's some cool stuff in there too. But there's right. good stuff in other books too. You know, and you, you can have religion without without always going to church. You you can define your relationship. Absolutely. Next message. Uh, hello, Gerald. This is Timothy. I'm calling to get your opinion on tithing. Uh, I was hoping you and your guests could discuss proper tithing amount. What is the correct amount to tithe? Do you tithe? Please discuss all things tithing. It's a very confusing issue. I personally like to receive some tithing and give tithing. All right, Timothy. Anyway. All right, Timothy, All right, Timothy wants to know the proper Thank tithing you. etiquette. Wants to know. Oh, <laughs> at Westboro? Just, just, just in general, yeah. But I, I, I know it's what, at Westboro, is it 10%? And actually, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, at Westboro, you're supposed to take jobs in the world itself, for lack of a better word, like, you know, high-paying jobs, right? Like lawyers, doctors, right? And you're automatically supposed to give 10% of your earnings back to the church. Is that right? 10% of your gross pay, as my father put it. I was a little bit uh, uh, unhappy about that when I was at Westboro because I wanted... Oh, it's gr gross is before taxes? your gross pay before taxes. Oh, basically. whoa. Whoa, that... Whoa, whoa, whoa. That, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, That's whoa. a lot more money than 10%. <laughs> what you see, That's right? 10% it is 10 of gross. Oh, my God. <laughs> you, I mean, can, can we get it after deductions, please, Dad? You know, just like you know, I got, I got, I got, I got all these taxes. I got to invest my four hundred one k. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was like, I got living expenses, and you know, you know. <laughs> but but to but to him though, you're being a good steward of of, of the Lord if you give ten percent of your. Yeah, because they say that yeah. you know God gave you God gave you the job, yeah. He gave you the resources. You can give the ten percent to support church activities, basically. Yeah. The tith the tithing basically p p pays for like the the lights in the mm. church building, you know, they make sure that those things run and that they got and the travel. Can't forget not the, travel. Not really much. Not, well, maybe some of the travel, but mostly it's just like, um, like supplies, like for picket signs right. and stuff. That's what the that's what the tithe goes to. 
I bet, I bet you your, the Michaels bill is insane. <laughs> the Michaels craft store bills. All right, I know you got to go. I got a couple more uh, voice notes to get through. That's okay. Next message. Hi, um, I had a question for your guest uh, from the church. Um, I was wondering what was something or what are some things that he actually misses about uh, living in that life or being in that community? I think that could be really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, what are some things that you do miss about, you know, being in Topeka, Kansas with your family and the church? More than anything else, I miss having an interaction with my parents. I miss Mm. playing games with my siblings. I miss the birthday parties that they have every month, you know, where they come together and, you know, poorly sing the happy birthday song and, you know, have cake and ice cream and, you know, you know, it's one of those things in which like, again, from the outside, we see it, you know, a certain way, but the real life people, right? These are, it's a real family, real people with close bonds to each other, you know, these connections that you no longer have in your life. Yeah. It's a darn shame. And, and if, is there anything that can do like if, you know, your mom and dad were to call, call you up and say, hey, 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 Zach, you know, we want to have a conversation. We want you to come back. You know, we understand where you're coming from, um, but we want you to come back home and, you know, come to this birthday party. Would you do it? Or would they have to like condemn, you know, or would they have to like stop the teachings? They would never do that, but mm-hmm. if they did, I've I've never blocked any of their numbers. I mean, they I have my email is on every one of my social media accounts. So yeah, I mean, there's nothing stopping them except themselves. Make sure reaching out to you. And, and how many of your siblings? Because you have, let me guess, eleven siblings, right? Oh no, ten siblings. Your mom has eleven kids, right? Correct. And and how many um left the church? Five of the eleven left. Five of the eleven. So there's six left. That's to backtrack a second, that's one thing I, I forgot to ask you about because you talk about how there is some sort of hypocrisy, right? Like within the church itself and, and, and the teachings and beliefs. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, premarital sex is frowned upon. Of course. Children out of wedlock is frowned upon. Did that happen? Right? Like, like premarital, like uh, kids out of wedlock were any of those born specifically absolutely the people of west pro <laughs> are not any holier than anybody else they also have committed their fair share of sins as they would put it of course they would say that they're apologetic about it but it doesn't change the fact that you know my mom had my brother sam out of wedlock or yeah. sorry wedlock <laughs> um you know, and there were a handful of my other aunts or uncles that have had kids that were out of wedlock or, you know, what have you, or premarital sex, stuff like that, or adultery even, perhaps. So that, that's, yeah. and that's the thing is like, they believe they're forgiven for their sins because they repent, but they don't believe in repentance or salvation for anybody else. Which is, yeah. it's, uh, it's, I, I mean, if they're capable of making mistakes, right, and being worthy of respect, anyways, I don't understand why my mom, for the I don't know if she still does this, but when I was there, she would, you know, talk to young women on the picket line and call them simple sluts mm-hmm. when she doesn't know the first thing about any one of these women that she's talking to. Was it because they weren't dressed modestly? Maybe, maybe not. Because I know you can't show too much skin in Westboro either. (laughs) Yeah. Skin is frowned upon. Mm -hmm. Only at Westboro. (laughs) Next message. Yo, what's up? It's Huggy. Um, I had a question. From Westboro Baptist Church, did you feel like there was a heavy, like a guilt that is among the people? It's just There's a lot of hate, and it's heavy, heavy hate. Do you feel like there's any sort of remorse? that you can feel within the members that are still following it or when you were there? Do people feel bad? want to know. Thanks. It's a very good question. And I got to tell you, they do live with a lot of remorse, not for the pickets, Mm. but for their own past actions. And I mean, like, I'm pretty certain that some of my, like, aunts have something against my mom or each other. Like, I don't know. 
I know that they hold grudges against each other. I know that it's not all hunky dory. Yeah. I know that it's not, and I know that they must have poor self esteem because they certainly didn't teach me how to have good self esteem. Yeah. I didn't learn that until after I left West Pro. So it's how, because of all the con- condemnation they face, right? It's like everything you do, you're gonna go to hell over. So it, that that has to mess with you psychologically at some point. It has, it's gonna play, take a toll on you, your mental health. Absolutely, and it definitely took a huge toll on me, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's right. They are miserable. They won't admit it, but I'm, you know, when my sisters, Megan and Grace, left, mm. my mom was depressed for like six months. Right. Free dope. She Subscribe on Apple, withdrawn, Spotify, and wherever you and get she podcasts. Went about her business just very quietly. Yeah. But I knew she was, she missed them horribly. And I'm, I, it, it's like they can't have. I guess they can't feel anything once you leave, even though they do. They do. On uh, human nature, they feel the pain, right, of, of losing contact with a family member. But due to church teachings, they can't have contact with you after you've been excommunicated. So they believe they're still upholding their bargain with God. By the way, um, before I forget to mention, uh, there's a three-part documentary. I found it on, on Amazon by Louis Thoreau. We talked about it earlier in the episode. Um Go ahead and watch. It's called America's Most Hated Family. I believe it's a three-part on Amazon, done for the BBC. It's there. Even if you don't have Amazon Prime, you can send it for a free trial. Even the BBC channel on the Amazon Prime is a free trial. So there's no excuse not to watch it to get more context in this conversation. And also, Zach, tell me, once again, the name of your book and how we can get a hold of it. So the book is called The Masters, How to Achieve Self-Mastery and Spiritual Enlightenment. And you can find it on Amazon.com. It's um, it's currently it, it's currently up. I'm still working on the marketing for the book it, it, and it. self-publishing it, but it's it's coming along now. <laughs> and, and I can't wait to read it. And I can't wait to have you on again because we didn't get into your personal life. Actually, you know, you know, marriage, kids, and all that stuff. Like we didn't talk about anything with that. So I hope to have you on again soon to pick up on that part of the conversation. Sounds cool to me. And thank you so much again for taking the time. Make sure you uh, check out Zach's book as well. I'm going to post the information right in the show notes. So if you just open up your listening device, there's a link right there. Click that. You'll be taken to um, his book on Amazon. Zach, thanks again. Thank you very much, Ron.